Hello my friends and visitors and welcome to Monet Cafe, my home studio where I bring you free art lessons specializing in pastel art but sometimes other things too. So welcome everyone and today it's a rainy day where I am and I love creating on rainy days. I haven't had a lot of time to paint lately and I know a lot of you can relate because I see your comments of how you just long to get some free time. Life is just too busy, isn't it? So I was fortunate to sneak in a little bit of time um, sneaking away from my other responsibilities and get into my studio today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to share with you the process of how I go about, especially in a limited time, of how I choose what I'm going to paint and some of my thought processes. I get a lot of your questions and comments about um, how do I choose a photo, how do I work from a photo that maybe is lackluster, doesn't have a lot of um, color, how do I choose my color palette. And um, so I thought, you know, I don't have a particular plan other than letting you join me in my journey of starting a painting and where I go from there. So I'm glad you're here with me and let's get started. I hope we're going to have some fun and create beautiful things. Alright, so getting started is usually about finding a good photograph or some sort of reference image to get started from. And I took some photos recently when we were in St. Augustine Beach, Florida. It's just such a beautiful place. And, uh, and some of the days I was there, it was a little bright for a great photo, but uh, I had enough good material to uh, snap some shots and, uh, and work from, you know, even if it's not a perfect photograph. Um, so anyway, I was flipping through here and looking at some of my images and I found one that I really liked, which is, oh, that's got some beautiful color in those uh, waves there and uh, sand. And I believe it, yes, it was one of these. Notice the, again, I always am, I'm just a fan of the S-shaped curve and going off into the distance. I also like how this just has a little bit of water showing back there. I love something that leads your eye and you just want to go back there. And it's almost like you want to climb that hill and see what's over there. But um, there were a couple more that I really liked. This one, I have the horizon line a little bit too in the center. So if I was to paint this, I would move it either down or up more. Um, there's another one that I like even better than these. This is looking really nice. I like that one, but I just did a painting that was vertical, so I was thinking I might do, yes, that's the one right there. That's just got some nice uh, energy going on in it, and uh, it, even though this is one of the things I'm going to talk about, we've got kind of a bland colored sky, and the sky is like the same color as the sand. Um, I'm going to uh, reevaluate that photo, and uh, kind of let probably the color of the sky set the mood. So um, sometimes I just put on some music and I just let the music guide me and, and just choose a color to start working with and the other colors just kind of flow from there. So I'll try to talk through that process a little bit. But this is going to be my choice. Yes, I like this photo. Let's get to it. Alright, so now I just show a little bit of my setup. I like to gear my um, videos I know we've got different levels of artists that view these and uh, come to our Monet Cafe art group as well. So um, we've got beginner to advanced and really some really advanced beautiful work in our group. But I, I never want to forget the beginner. And sometimes um, when we're teaching or doing anything we can take some things for granted that you know these things and sometimes you don't. If you hear tap, 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 that's my little Boston Terrier. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd just talk through a little bit of this. I just have, um, you know, people do various things of how they set this up. I have a piece of foam core board that I use um, to put up whatever surface I'm going to be working on. I have a system that I'm going to probably tear all this off. I have a way to keep my um, my surface on here without having to tape all the way around it. It's just a little hinge system that I use. But right now I have a little challenge with my UART paper. This is UART sanded paper, 400 grade or grit. Um, and uh, it's warped, okay? This can happen in, in humidity, and we have a lot of humidity in Florida. So sometimes my paper does this. But someone in our group shared a wonderful tip of how you can iron your UART paper. And I have another video. I'll try to put a little information button in the top of the YouTube video so you can click that or just find it um, on how to straighten out warped U, uh, UART paper. So anyway, now I already know I'm going to have a horizontal format, so I've got to get that going. This is just a simple piece of aluminum foil that's going to be my dust catcher. It's very easy and cheap and effective. I keep down here, I like to clean my pastels as I work if there's any dirt. 
I used to do it on the side of my painting, but it kind of gets in the way of just the whole process. So I end up keeping a piece of newsprint somewhere near me. So this one's from the previous painting. And uh, I, just, I just mark, make a quick little mark, and it cleans it off before I start using it. If it's dirty, sometimes it's not. So anyway, um, that's just a little general of how I get started. I like to keep my tools close by. Um, many have asked, what is this little blending tool? It's just a piece of pipe foam insulation that you can buy at any hardware store. And uh, learn this trick from Karen Margulis, uh, incredible pastel artist. Um, so I don't blend a lot, but when I do, um, this is a good way to do it. Somebody else on our channel told me I saved this a wine cork top that you can um, use to blend. I haven't tried it yet, but I thought, well, hey, I'm going to stick it over there and give it a shot. So anyway, just things like that, and your pastels uh, readily accessible. And uh, then the rest is just uh, to prep work is uh, getting our color palette and, and getting our sketch in. So let's get started with that. Okay, so this is my basic setup. I had to do a little bit more um, taping down um, with my tape because I ironed the UART paper. It still had a little bit of warping to it. I hope it's not too bad, but uh, that just secured it down a little bit more than I normally do. And I like to keep my iPad or whatever reference image I'm using on my right side since I'm left-handed. That way, I, if I had it on this side, which I've done sometimes, I mean, it's not terrible, but it actually is just easier when you don't have to look over your arm. This way, it's more open for me to paint. Um, you guys may have noticed that I often keep my filming on this side though so that you're not looking over my arm and the camera is over here. So little things like that sometimes help just to where you're comfortable painting. And so, you know, kind of maybe think about where you put your reference image so it's just easy to see. Okay, so now I'm just going to get started, but um, I wanted to mention that I often will play around with the reference image. I'll put it in some sort of photo editing software and play around, maybe oversaturate it a little bit, play around with some filters. And all that really does for me, it's not like I'm going to try to recreate exactly how I've changed it, but it kind of gives me some creative ideas and uh, sets a mood, perhaps. Um, I think sometimes um, when we get started, we try to paint the photograph exactly everything, even all the detail, all the colors and everything, and that's great when you get started. Um, but eventually, with a lot of practice, we learn to realize that the photograph is basically um, just a photograph. We want to use it as a guide and interpret it in our way that we see as art. So it's really just inspiration and uh, and that doesn't come easy at first. That takes a lot of practice and I'm still practicing too. So anyway, so I might play around with the photograph a little bit, then I'll get started with the sketch and then we're going to pick out the palette. Yippee! <laughs> Alright, so I've done just a little bit of editing to the photograph um, to really get a little bit more contrast and to see things a little better and uh, um, kind of get rid of some of the whiteness of the sand. And um, now, I'm, you know, sometimes I like to be careful if I'm trying to do an accurate drawing of something like a person or an animal to have my sizes in the same ratio. Um, this is actually a little wider um, format than this is um, horizontally. And in this case, it doesn't matter um, because you can kind of, you know, kind of just make it work. And now I just have a um, new pastel, Prismacolor new pastel. It's a harder pastel. You can actually paint with these too, but they're uh, they're better for beginning a painting rather than ending a painting. Soft pastels are better for the final, like the icing on the cake is the real softies. Um, and there's a great catalog you can get from Dakota Art that uh, has all kinds of information about pastels and papers and good info. I'll have to share a picture of that catalog. Um, but anyway, so this is just to get in a basic sketch. Then I got some other decisions to make such as underpainting and things like that. So. Um, I'm just kind of looking at, I like to usually break these. I have a smaller one somewhere, but I'm going to break it because often I like to use the sides of it. All right, so now I've got me just a, a little piece here. All right, so um, I, I like to work in shapes rather than lines. And um, I'm already feeling that buckle a little bit of that paper here. And I don't have much of a skyline here. It's really pretty minimal. Um, but I know I've got this uh, little bank here coming down. Um, might have it a little high there. And um, or the, the end of the trail, so to speak. And then I've got some grasses coming up here. They're going to be real wispy. And then um, just kind of, I'm not worried about that fence or anything right now. This is just a, a general shape. We're going to have, of course, grasses going up there. I'm just kind of getting in where this um, background line goes. Definitely feeling some of the uh, shape of the paper there that's bubbled up, but that's okay. 
We want to see, it'll keep me impressionistic, right? <laughs> now this is going to be a darker area back here, but it's a little further away than this front area. This will be the darkest, but this is gonna be in the, it's in the shadow too. The sun, you know, you can already kind of tell where the sun's coming from. It's hitting on some of these grasses here. Um, so you can kind of get an idea. You wanna keep that in mind as you sketch. Okay, so I know I have this little area here. Um, Again, you're just getting in basics. All this other stuff, if it's not just right, can kind of be corrected as you go. Now, I do kind of want to look where the entryway to this is. So sometimes I'll pause if I don't have the same ratio of, of paper um, to the image that I'm drawing from. And uh, bigger is better always when you're starting out a painting. Just get it nice and loose and free and fresh, okay? So um, this is actually going to be some grasses coming around here in this area. Um, a little bit down there and then there's more sand there's like a bank right here all right and then this is to gonna just come around and have that fence just kind of get in the flow that's kind of what I think of when you're starting a painting you want to capture the energy now I know it exits like about you're not quite that's a halfway mark where my iPad the dot is it comes down a little more hat more than halfway here's about halfway so it's going to exit right about here okay so that's just sometimes you learn to visually measure quickly the more you do this so um you know just getting some general shapes okay so there we go looks like a mess but that's okay because you don't you don't need to do anything special at this point we got a general curvy road it'll curve a little more when we add little highlights and things then we've got our um our blue sky our blue water back there and uh, now i just have to make a decision kind of want to get something off down on the paper of how am i going to do an underpainting i can do um uh, I can do a complementary underpainting where I put down a lot of the opposite colors of what I'm going to be using. Uh, in this case, if you're going to be using greens and um, anything in the nature kind of uh, palette, you typically do an underpainting. Complementary colors would be oranges and yellows and reds and things like that. Um, but I don't know. I'm not feeling that right now. Um, I'm actually thinking... I might use, I have some acrylic inks I haven't used in a long time. And uh, I think I'm going to try those. The neat thing about UART paper and a lot of pastel surfaces, not all of them, there's one in particular you can't really add water to, which is uh, Sennelier Le Carte. I think someone said you could, but I've never had any luck. But UART paper, quite a bit of the surfaces with pastels, the sanded surfaces, you can add water to. UART is very durable. So you've got a lot of options as to what you want to lay down as an underpainting. You can use watercolor. You can use thinned out oil paint. You can use acrylic paint. Um, you can use gouache, um, you can use wax pastels, which I've used before. Anything that you don't want to, uh, it to fill up the tooth of the paper. So anything that's kind of just kind of glaze over the surface, you can use, and it works great for an underpainting. So yeah, I think I'm going to try some of those acrylic inks and, uh, and maybe lay down a, a few other little new pastels lightly and, um, and uh, kind of blend those with some alcohol. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's always fun and uh, always fresh. All right, so I decided to use some of the new pastels by Prismacolor to lay down a basic underpainting. I'm going to do an alcohol wash over that and then apply some acrylic inks to get the real dark, darkest darks. And the reason new pastels will work okay for an underpainting is because they're harder, they don't fill up the tooth so much, okay? Um, but I love to get, a gen get the surface covered um, before I start working on any little detail like that. So this is a great way to do it. Now, as far as color palette goes, this is just a little um, uh, tray that I use to travel with. I've broken up almost every color of my new pastels, and um, so it's just easy to travel with these. And I am going to be kind of choosing a color palette. And a lot of times I let the, um, the sky set the mood, of, which actually is a great way to think of it because often the sky does set the mood because almost everything in the land on the, on the earth is a reflection of what's happening in the sky, okay? And I don't know why I'm feeling some pinks um, going on back here. I'm just kind of seeing that. And uh, so I kind of want to get that, but um, I want to make sure I get these values right. I know value is king. I always talk about that. Uh, it gets you, you get better as the more you do it. But if you have trouble with um, seeing values, there's this neat little grayscale value finder. I don't know. It's a couple of bucks. You can get it on most art uh, supply places online. And um, it's got these neat little keyhole things. So in your reference photo, you can kind of judge 
what that value is. Um, but again, it gets better. The more you do it, the better you get at doing it. And values tend to decrease in the distance, okay? So a lot of little uh, tricks you can learn. But I'm going to go with this. Um, notice how, how kind of it comes out dark on this paper. But I'm setting a mood to the sky. And um, I just really like this pink feel. And this is going to get blended in with uh, alcohol or water. You can do either or. Alcohol just dries faster. And um, I'm going to let this be real flowy and drippy. And um, again, this is just to fill up this, um, this background. All right, so I've got the, the kind of pinkish, peachy sky. Um, I really um, like the idea of this water that's back here. It's going to be a little bit more right here in between the two. I like the idea of like a, a turquoisey water instead of that like almost royal blue water. I don't know. I just like that idea. I'm going to keep this kind of um, light in color and um, in mood, you know, springy and fresh. I don't know, maybe because it is spring right now. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. We do need to get in some of our our deeper colors. I like to use uh, purples a lot in shadows, um, but we got to get kind of some earthy colors going on too. And by the way, what I'm doing now, even though I'm kind of altering the colors a little bit, I'm doing what's called local color, meaning you're doing a color that would be more natural to the scene instead of complementary color that would be opposite to the color. Complementary color is nothing more than opposite the color wheel. So if your grasses are green, you got a lot of green grasses going on somewhere, complementary is going to be red. It's on the opposite side of the color wheel. The color wheel is your friend. A lot of people are like, oh, that's cool. What is it? It's got so much. Just read your color wheel. You will get so much information from it. I have a video um, that really helps learning about colors, the color wheel, warm and cool colors, um, what colors to use together. Oh, that's so pretty. I'm such like a magpie for color. That's the most beautiful blue. Okay, so going to get going on this. Um, and uh, I'm going to, again, this is more like local color. So I'm just, um, I'm looking quickly at, I want to keep some energy and direction to this too. I'm looking quickly at um, just the, uh, my reference photo. And I'm just kind of jotting in some of these um, darks here. Okay, I've got more over here. I'm not worried about that fence right now. Put some more darks back there. Like I said, this is going to be, I'm going to make this darker. But this back side of this um, hill, it's going to be dark. I even see some pretty pretty blues in there that we'll add later. Okay, so we got direction really helps with how things move and flow, okay? Um, all right, so let me get in some of this. We've got, if you squint your eyes, you can see more value, value more clearly if you're squinting than if you're just looking at it with your eyes wide open. All right, so I'm going to get in some of these other colors in here. All right, so I've got the pinks, I've got the turquoise, I've got the purples. Now, I think I want to get in some good rusty colors in here, too. I've got one that I started with, and uh, this is kind of a, a medium kind of a value here, too, that I'm getting in some of those little areas that are a little bit darker. And I'm just, um, I'm not going really hard with this right now. Um, just kind of a, a little light touch. Coming down here. I want to kind of get that road a little bit more defined there and uh, where things are going. Okay, I'm keeping all the ones that I've used in a little section in this box. Um, and now I'm seeing where this is actually not a new pastel, it's another pastel. Let's see how that is. I like these blues here for this side of the, uh, the hill. This is in shadow right over here, so um, I might can actually use that turquoise. I want to keep it consistent, so keep your colors kind of harmonious. So again, as long as you're getting value correct, you can just really kind of get super creative with color, as long as it's kind of consistent throughout the piece. All right, so I'm getting the mood going now. That's the main thing. All right, I'm just going to paint a little bit, and then I'll get the alcohol going.
I have to resist the tendency to keep painting and um, not get too many colors going on here. But um, I've just again set a mood kind of with a general color palette, um, keeping values uh, accurate to the scene but they don't have to be the exact same color. So now all I'm going to do, I keep a little spritzer bottle. What is this? Some kind of a vanilla and sugar spritzer. <laughs> so if you have any of these, they, they make a pretty fine mist, which is why I like to use this. This just has um, alcohol and water in it. I think it's uh, probably two-thirds alcohol and one-third water. And uh, I just use it to spray. And at this point, I'm going to need some paper towels, which I see back here, because I want to keep my brush cleaned out. I may grab some water real quick, too. All I'm going to do, I work top to bottom or sections because I don't want to contaminate areas. This is going to bleed and run a little bit in, in here. Um, but we're just going to basically get um, the underpainting kind of set. When you add the alcohol to it, um, it's going to make it to where it doesn't blend as much when we add the pastels on top of it. So, all right, I'm going to get started. Okay, so now I have my water, just a cup of water down here to clean my brush, my paper towels. And I like to use the bigger br the brush, the better. I actually could use one bigger than this. Um, but sometimes I'll keep a small brush if I have something in little areas or whatever. But I think this one will probably suffice. So this is going to be just to set the mood and you want to stay loose with this. It's okay if drips happen. Um, I kind of like the drips. So I put down a, a really good amount of... Um, the alcohol and uh, I just start kind of blending and working and brush strokes can be random um, I'm careful to try to not get the colors mixed too much in certain areas because you don't want like all that dark coming up in the sky and I just rinsed my brush again and now I've got enough of this uh, alcohol down here to be able to work that little water back there and maybe blend that a little bit more right in there. Set a nice little tone. And once again, this is not anything more than what you're setting your painting on top of. I kind of look back at the, the reference photo to um, once you get in these areas, you can get your strokes kind of a little bit more in the way that they are in the painting or in the photo. So this is dry now, and um, this got a little muddied here. I got too much water on it there, but at this point, that's the cool thing. It can be a mess. It doesn't matter. We've got some values in, and now we can get started. Um, now I have these acrylic inks. These are acrylic inks by Daler Rowney. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and I learned this technique. I'm not very experienced at it, but I learned of this technique from um, Bethany Fields, another great pastel artist. And uh, this is just kind of a deep, deep green. It almost looks like a black. But uh, I'm using just a really old bristly brush. And the cool thing about that is it keeps it really um, loose looking. So we're just gonna take where those darkest darks are down there where the grasses are. Uh, I'm just getting in my darks. Now this is the darks are really what makes the painting start to come alive. Um, and you want to keep them, obviously, in the areas where the values are the darkest. You know, it's not that hard. But now I'm just using this brush to kind of paint these darks in. The pastels can go over top of this. This does not fill up the tooth that much. I see this little area right here. It's almost like a little indention area where the grasses are coming up. So I kind of want to get that. Little section that comes out like right there. The cool thing about uh, just a rough brush like this is nature is pretty, um, um, I like to say, harmoniously random. <laughs> it still has harmony, but there's uh, like a, just a neat um, variety to it. Now, I don't want to get too much of this back there. I'm just little bits right back in there, okay? So these are the darkest darks. Dab a little bit more of this in here. And as it gets off my brushes, as I'm moving back, because values get lighter in the distance or um, 
less value in the distance. All right, so I still have it. I'm squinting, squinting, squinting. That's These two are definitely the darkest parts. So you see how I just added those dollops of dark, dark on top of that? Even more. Really dark down in here. And again, you can put pastel on top of this because um, it will, this doesn't fill up the tooth. All right, I'm gonna be quiet <laughs> and just work a little. This one is a little bit more of a green. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see the names of the colors, but I'll try to share um, what they are. This one's not quite as dark as that other really deep one was. You can kind of see this color here. It's almost like a deep mustardy color. All right, and my brush is a little wet. So see, that's not as dark in value as this one was. So that's why it works a little bit better the further away. Okay, so this is the purple I'm going to be using now. I put my glasses on so maybe I can actually see the color. Velvet Violet. That is teeny. Um, I actually wanted to get a color I had seen called, I think it's Purple Lake. It's a dark, ooh, hear that thunder. I love it. It's a dark, deep purple, um, which I, I, it was out of stock when I um, ordered it or would have ordered it. But um, this actually is more, it's actually almost an iridescent kind of a purple. And it might work for the purposes because I don't need a real deep purple on this side of the, uh, the sand where it's going to be shaded. So again, I'm going to use my bristle brush. I'm just going to work with this and uh, have fun. You know, that's what we're doing here. 